Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming and welcome to our house. This week on our My Thought Lecture, I would like to uh, discuss hypocrisy. And the question becomes, what is hypocrisy? Now Webster's dictionary defines hypocrisy as a feigning to be what one is not or to believe one what one does not. So it's the false assumption of an appearance of virtue or religion. Milton wrote, hypocrisy, the only evil that walks invisible except to God alone. So if I were to ask you, is being a hypocrite a good thing or a bad thing? What do you think you would answer? Now, interestingly enough, <clears throat> the answer is not black and white. It would depend upon the situation. Now, what do I mean by that? In the secular world, being a hypocrite, being disingenuous, would definitely be considered a negative trait, a personality fault. People say a lot, but do their actions, re are, are they a reflection of their words? They talk the talk, but do they walk the walk? Many times, people's actions are connected to the needs of the moment. They want something, and they're willing to bend their morals, their standards, their words, whatever it takes to acquire their goal. I think that the one place that this scenario can easily be seen is in the secular world of dating. Many times men who date in the secular world have one objective, a conquest. They will say and do whatever the situation demands to reach their goal. You know, I had a friend and uh, she was a very attractive woman. One night we both happened to be at a bar together and we were standing back to back talking to other people. Now, she happened to be talking to a young man who was very interested in taking her home with him. She was gorgeous, but not overly smart. That didn't stop her from talking a lot and having a variety of opinions on many different topics. She considered herself a, a, a bit of an expert. At least she assumed that that was the case. After all, men hung on her every word. They laughed at all her so-called jokes. She was a social success. Well, not really, but she was gorgeous. So I'm close enough to hear her talking to this guy. And so she first makes a positive statement on a topic and he quickly agrees. Then she makes a negative statement that contradicts her first statement completely. And again, he totally agrees. I couldn't help but laugh. She didn't care, he didn't care what she had said. In fact, I'm not even sure that he heard anything as she was saying. He was too busy praying that somehow he could convince her to come home with him. <laughs> he didn't pray hard enough. It's so sad that people can be so disingenuous. You, you would love to think that people would treat you with honesty and with truth. One of the worst offenders of hypocrisy are salesmen. Of course, not all salesmen are hypocrites. There are many who are straight and upfront. But there are others whose focus is on one thing and one thing only, on the sale, the now. Once the sale is over, so are the compliments and the relationship no longer exists. If they should need you again, they will reignite the flames of the fake friendship that had died out. To make the sale, they will say and do whatever it takes. Truth and honesty, well, we can all agree on the concept, but what comes first is the sale, whatever it takes. As the movie said, show me the money. When we look around the world, hypocrisy is alive and well. I sometimes wonder if politicians take a polygraph test, you know, but theirs I'm sure is set up just a little bit different than ours. You see, a normal polygraph test is a test to see if you're lying with politicians that would detect there was any truth in anything that they said. The biggest problem with hypocrisy is that it becomes habitual. The answer doesn't have to be true, it just has to fit the situation. You put that robe of hypocrisy on daily, and then one day you come to realize that it's no longer a robe, it has become skin. It has taken on a life of its own. Yes, it owns you. The hole that you have dug for yourself 
with your lies has become, in a sense, your own grave. Climb out before you dig too deep. Think of Bernie Madoff. He started off with a little lie, and then it took on a life of its own. When he would refuse to accept someone as a client, <clears throat> the person was incensed, highly insulted. People were begging him to take their money. He said one thing, knowing that the words were totally hypocritical, outright lies. At that moment, <clears throat> he became a servant, and hypocrisy was his master. You know, I feel sorry for young people today. The world has become so hypocritical. You don't know who to listen to, whom to believe. I grew up in a much different time. People were somehow kinder, nicer, more real. Sure, there were problems everywhere, but still we felt that there was honesty in the world. You turned on the radio or the television, and you believed most of what you heard or read. After all, how could someone tell a lie that would be heard <clears throat> or seen on the airwaves or in print? It could easily be checked. Can someone really tell that big a lie in public? <laughs> Today, sadly, the answer is yes. You're never quite sure of anything that you read in the newspaper or see on television. News anchors, as we used to know them, were honest journalists. Those who presented the facts to the listening public with as little bias as possible. Yes, there were moments of commentary, but it was moments, not a whole show. They respected us enough to believe that all we needed was the information, the facts, and that we were more than capable to make an intelligent decision on our own. I don't need to listen to a sermon or a tirade about any person or subject from someone who is totally prejudiced, especially from someone who I don't see as a role model or a journalistic who has journalistic integrity. So in moments like this, where do we turn? Where can we find truth that we so desire and need, not just in our lives, <clears throat> but in the world in general? God gave us an instruction manual, the Torah. When we study its words, what we find is truth. It is truth that truth is not always self-evident. But in the end, every word, every story leads us to the same destination. Truth. The Hebrew word for emet, truth, is so special to God, he decided to take it as one of his holy names. If you take the last letters of the first three words in the opening verse in the book of Genesis, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. The last letter of these three words is a tough, an aleph, and a mem. These three letters together spell the word emet, truth. If you take the last letter of the last three words of creation, in chapter 2, verse number 3, it states, Bara Elohim Lasot, which God had created to do. Again, you have an aleph, a mem, and a tough. These three letters together spell the word emet, truth. So we see that God signed, so to speak, his name to the beginning and the end of his creation with emet, with truth. Interesting, the three Hebrew letters that make up the word emet <clears throat> have a unique feature in that they are the first, the middle, and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. This alludes to the fact that truth is consistent from beginning to the end. In addition, each of the three letters stand on two feet. Truth is rock solid. It does not waver. So by connecting to God and his values, what we do is we connect to absolute truth. Hypocrisy should have no place in any place in Orthodox Judaism. Now, according to Jewish law, you cannot do a good deed through a, through a sin. And you can miss it through an Avera. Robin Hood. You can't steal from the rich and then give it to the poor and then call it a good deed. According to Jewish law, that would be a sin. Stealing, not a mitzvah, not a good deed. That being the case, I began this thought by saying that not everything is black and white. Sometimes things are gray. But how could that apply to religion that is based on total truth? 
You know, I grew up in a traditional home, not religious. But I had a grandmother who was religious, and she convinced my mother to send us to yeshiva, the Hebrew school. I attended until the age of 13, and then I continued my religious education at Nair Yisrael Rabbinical College in Baltimore. I studied in their high school for two years, but I had questions, and the grass really looked greener on the secular side of the street. I remember it was just before the high holidays. I used to hang out with the Sephardi boys that came from Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn, New York. They were directed by an older student who was their spiritual guide. He would try to motivate them in their service of God. After all, most of them came from less religious homes. I guess he thought that he could help motivate me as well, and so he took me aside and talked to me about heaven and hell. He told me that there are three types of Jews, a tzaddik, righteous person, a bainani, a middle-of-the-road person, and a rasha, an evil person. He continued and said that tzaddik goes to heaven after his lifetime on earth, a rasha, an evil person, goes to hell, purgatory. He said that the Bainani, the middle-of-the-road person, is a fence-sitter, and that he too goes to hell. I listened to what he had told me, and I said to him, I'm not a tzaddik, nor am I a rasha, which makes me a Bainani. So you're telling me that I can look forward to a life in purgatory. That being the case, if I won't receive a portion in the world to come, then I might as well enjoy myself here, in this world. Why am I pursuing a dream that I won't be able to attain? After all, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. That day, I packed my bags and I left the school. Now, I just didn't leave the school. <laughs> I left everything that was connected to religion. I became like the character in Faust. I, so to speak, sold my soul to the devil. I reasoned in my mind that I still believed in God. I just thought I would take a different path in life, a path that would be dictated on what I felt was good to me. I kind of saw life as a party and I was going to have the time of my life. I did believe that after my years on this earth would be finished, that I would be called on to stand before God, God Almighty, the so-called day of judgment. I thought that I would say to God, no, I wasn't religious, but I tried to live my life decently, at least according to how I define decent. I would tell God that I purposely did nothing religious, purposely. I never kept Shabbos again. I didn't put on filling or pray three times a day. I even went so far as to eat pork, cheeseburgers, ribs, not because I had a big desire to eat them, but because I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I reasoned that if I kept Shabbat this week because I had nothing to do, but next week I planned on going to the beach with my girlfriend, that would be totally disingenuous. I would be a hypocrite. <laughs> it's amazing what you can make yourself believe. I saw serving God as all or nothing at all. So at my heavenly hearing, I would say to the court, if you're going to burn me, then burn me. <laughs> but I did enjoy my time on earth. The last words that I would say in my defense would be, at least I wasn't a hypocrite. I convinced myself that I could actually have my cake and eat it too. This was my mantra. And I followed it for 18 years. Tell you the truth, God kept his part of the bargain. The life was good. And I was very successful in all my endeavors. The party was fun. I was happy. And I was content. <laughs> But then God threw me a curve. After six years of trying to have a child, we were blessed with a baby boy. I walked out of a delivery room and everything changed. I became what's known as a Baal Tshuva, <clears throat> a returning religious Jew. I wanted to thank God for the precious gift that he had given us. I looked at my newborn son and I thought to myself, he's going to grow up to be you. Is that good enough? I had to answer honestly. My previous lifestyle may have been acceptable for me, but it was not. It was not acceptable for my precious son. I, so I connected with a Lubavitch rabbi who would wind up attending my son's circumcision. 
He became very close to my son, and we also became lifelong friends. We began to learn together, and I found a completely different approach to Judaism, to God, and to his Torah. I was given a totally different perspective on, so to speak, the Tzaddik, the Benini, and the Rasha. The Benini was not the Fensitera, who would go to purgatory. Instead, according to Hasidus, he was seen as a very special person. One, we would all be pleased and honored to become, as we say in Yiddish, halabai, if only it were so. I was made to understand that every action that we perform in this world stands by itself. Which means that even though a person is going to have bacon and eggs for breakfast in the morning, that doesn't mean that they can't or shouldn't put on tefillin and say the morning prayers that day. It is not a situation of all or nothing at all. Each mitzvah, each good deed stands on its own. If that were not the case, the truth is none of us would succeed. Life is a journey. We need to start somewhere. And even though all of our actions are not consistent, it is not a case of hypocrisy. It's basically a process. A process where hopefully we grow and become wiser. We should see <clears throat> each mitzvah that we perform as a diamond. And each diamond is worth a fortune. Be greedy. And don't let a diamond slip through your fingers. You know, I think the analogy of a diamond is perfect. After all, what is a diamond but a piece of coal that did well under pressure? We see examples of being disingenuous in the Torah in the lives of the forefathers. They purposely called their wives sisters when they traveled so as to protect their own lives. Abraham, Abraham used it, this ruse twice and Yitzchak once. But isn't that being hypocritical? God tells us in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, in the portion of Achrei Mot, 18.5, that his Torah was given to us, Lachai Bahem, to live with them. There are three cardinal mitzvot that one is required to give up their life for. Other than that, we are obligated, we are commanded to transgress a Torah commandment, even the Shabbat, to save a life. We see that Yaakov was disingenuous when he met his brother Esau after 36 years of separation. The Torah describes in the book of Genesis in the portion of Ayishlach chapter 33, how Esau, his brother, came to greet Yaakov with 400 armed men now, rather than risk an armed conflict, Yaakov sent gifts and showered honor to his older brother. He bowed seven times when they finally met. The end result? The two brothers hugged and kissed each other. Better an insincere peace than a sincere war. When Esau offered to travel with Yaakov, Yaakov politely declined with a pretext that his children and the animals would slow Esau down. He told his brother to travel ahead and that he would meet him at Seir. Rashi tells us Yaakov was being disingenuous. He never really meant to travel that far. Rashi says, if his intention is to do me harm, let him wait until I come to him. But he did not go. His words and his actions were meant to save lives. You know, we even have an example from God Almighty himself. When Sarah, the first mother of Israel, she was 89 years old. She heard that she would have a child. She laughed in disbelief with the words, Vadoni Zokin, and my husband is old. When God repeats her words to Avram, her husband, rather than call, cause a marital rift between the couple, God changes her words and tells Avram that she laughed, saying, Zokanti, that she was old. God is teaching us. That telling the truth in all situations can be unnecessarily hurtful. A person who does so out of a feeling of righteousness is called chassid shota, a righteous fool. We all need to be sensitive to the feelings of others. Common sense is a prerequisite for our relationship with people and our service to our Creator. Hurting people's feelings is not godly, nor is it religious. In fact, the term used to describe murder in Hebrew, the Hebrew word is shvichas domin. The spilling of blood is how it's translated. From this description, our rabbis have taught us that one who embarrasses another person is considered a murderer. Really? 
But why? The answer is when someone is embarrassed, the blood rushes to their face, they become flushed. And they compose themselves. The blood drains from their face, and now they become pale. You have caused the blood to move. Shvichat Domin, the spilling of blood. <clears throat> you are, in essence, a murderer. Now, bribery is a form of hypocrisy. You are trying to influence someone to do something positive or to change or remove a negative act or decision that could be detrimental to you or to your people. By giving them gifts of money, we see that with Yaakov, he used bribery to placate his brother's anger. Even though we frown on bribery, we have throughout our history in the diaspora used it time and time again when the, situ when the situation was dire and called for action. Armed conflict, war was not an option that the sages suggested for us in the exile. All we had was bribery and prayer. Him, to live with them. It worked. We are still here. There is a prayer that we recite twice daily in the everyday Amida that we say. So we say it at least six times a day. It states, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you. We are taught in Hasidus that thought, speech, and action are the garments of the soul and are actually even greater than the soul itself. Based on this concept, this prayer is a little backwards in that it begins with the words of my mouth and then mentions the thoughts of my heart. But why? I always thought that the wording is telling us a fact about people. Many people speak first and then they think about what they have said, which of course is incorrect. The proper order for a person is to think first before they speak, and that advice will save one a great deal of problems in life. However, there may well be another answer that connects to our topic of hypocrisy. Why does it mention speech first and then thought? Speech is external, and thoughts are internal. I think the verse is telling us that one should focus on the external, and it may well influence the internal. It is described in the Chazidus as Chitzonius Goreras Panemius, that the external influences the internal. Which means, even if you're not a nice person, fake it. Be a hypocrite. Speak nicely. Act nicely. Even if you really don't feel like doing it. The saying goes, fake it until you make it. If you act like a nice person long enough, meaning going against your true nature. The end may well be that you actually become a nice person. As we learn from the Talmud M'sochem, 60b, Bitok Shalolishma Balishma, that which was not done, not done initially for the right reason, in the end will be done for the right reason. We are all created with a challenge, some negative trait or addiction that really directs our lives in one form or another. We are all addicts. We see this concept alluded to in the words of the after blessing that we make after everything other than bread or cake and the prose of Israel. It states, that God created many souls each with its own unique deficiency. Our mission in life is to take that negative trait and turn it into a positive. While we work on our personal perfection, what we really want to do or say, and what we actually do, may continue to oppose each other. Of course, this becomes a challenge of life. Working on becoming who we need to be, and not being content on who we are, leaving our comfort zone. There's a story told of Henry Kissinger about Nixon's last night in the White House. It was 2 a.m. in the morning, and the two of them were leaving the residence for the last time. Nixon, as he was walking down the hallway, stopped in front of a portrait of John F. Kennedy. He looked up at the portrait, and he said, as he began to speak, he said to Kennedy, Do you know why they love you so much, and they hate me? When they see you, they see who they want to be. 
when they see me, they see who they really are. So we can see that even hypocrisy is not a trait that is evil. It is dependent on the situation and how the trait is used. With that, may God help and inspire us to continue to grow and never give up. And with that mindset, may we merit to herald in the coming of Mashiach Zikainu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Again, have a safe and a healthy and a happy week. And God bless. Shabbat Shalom.